All the sciences are founded to a greater or lesser degree on logical principles, and perhaps none more so than computer science. But logic has its limitations. Researchers at Warwick are trying to introduce a better sense of reality to computing, one that also takes account of human thinking and judgment. They call this approach empirical modelling. Well, we've used the word empirical because it means to do with observation and experiment. And I think the focus of our research is to complement the abstract, the formal, the logical, which is absolutely essential, but to complement that by taking serious account of the way we experience the world. And by serious, I, I mean um, ex experience that is live and direct, a bit like my talking right now, compared with some abstraction taken from that experience. To demonstrate empirical modelling, the team have come up with this coloured version of Sudoku. Here we have a, a model that's been constructed for conventional Sudoku. And you'll, you'll see here a, an example of a Sudoku grid. As you possibly know, the idea in Sudoku is to try to fill the grid with enough digits 1 to 9 in such a way that each row, each column and each region is filled with the digits 1 to 9 precisely. Um, one way that people would normally go about solving this is by thinking about what's possible, say, in this corner square and looking at the contents of the row and the column and the region that contains it. You reason that it can't be 2, 5, 6, 8, 7, 2, 3 or 5 and so these are the numbers left to you. What we've done in this instance is to embellish the model in such a way that we're trying to convey to you what possibilities exist for a square by associating with each of the colours, digits 1 to 9, a colour and then with the possibility 1, 4, 9, we'll associate a blend of the colour for 1 and the colour for 4 and the colour for 9. So, in, in order to introduce that element into the model, we just have to introduce a new set of definitions that link the background colour of a particular square to the possible digits that can be put in that square. And that's something like a dependency such as you might have in a spreadsheet. What you'll see at once when we've introduced this colour to, to the Sudoku puzzle is that clearly the squares to target are the ones that are dark because they're the ones that contain a blend of fewest possible colours. Over here you'll see the, the colours that are associated with each digit, one, two, nine. They're dark colours necessarily because they're going to be blended. Um, here, for example, I've identified a square where there's only one possible digit, um, namely a nine, and I can enter a 9 in there. As a side effect, it changes the colour of other squares. For example, that originally was 1, 4, 9, we observed. Now that we put a 9 in here, it's no longer possible to put a 9. So it, it now becomes a blend of 1 and 4. Putting the 9 in this square is an example of a very simple rule called candidature, single candidature. And it, it doesn't go very far in solving a Sudoku puzzle generally. You can only do a certain number of simple substitutions, simple insertions on the basis of that rule. Uh, a more interesting kind of rule is one where you, you think about what possibilities there are for putting, say, a 4 in, in this row. You'd see you can't put a 4 here or here because of this region. You can't put a 4 here or here because this 4 is already in this region. So. 4 is an obvious candidate for that square. It's the only one of these numbers that can possibly go there. Um, how would we highlight that using colour? Well, we can see that if we change the colour associated with 4, it'll, certain squares will become highlighted on the grid here, showing you where 4 could go. And you'll see that there is indeed just one inside this row. So these are two ways in which colour can support our logic. They can guide the filling in of the grid according to logical principles. And here's another example of the empirical approach. It's a model analysing a railway accident in 1861. 23 people died when one train crashed into another in a tunnel near Brighton. This was the first time a piece of new technology, the electrical telegraph, was being used to try to prevent something dangerous, something uh, dangerous happening. It, and it turns out it was far more complicated to integrate a piece of new technology with a complex 
physical human system than people had expected. And I think it's the same today. And I think computers are having the same, being presented with similar challenges when it comes to controlling complex processes or security issues. And it's part of our research to try to address those challenges in a way which um, takes account of experience and observables in a way which conventional computing finds very difficult to do. A third model was inspired by Dr. Bynan's interest in music and particularly the work of the composer Schubert. As a musician, I've been through all sorts of stages in my life. First of all, not being able to play music at all, if you like, looking at a, a score of music and wondering at its complexity, but not being able to translate that into anything that you could play on a piano. Um, but as you become more and more experienced, so you get, as it were, instant translation of rules that becomes second nature to the point where you can put a piece of music in front of you and this very complex score becomes something that instantly translates into positions for your fingers on the keyboard. And then beyond that, through musical theory, you come to appreciate, as in real time, nuances about the musical, say things like the harmonic structure, which keys you're in at the moment, whether this next progression of movement is unexpected or whether it's taking you to a remote place in relation to the original key. There's a lovely quotation from George Bernard Shaw, who was a music critic in the 19th century, when Schubert's Ninth Symphony, which was regarded as a masterpiece when that first came to, to this country, it was discovered 60 years after his death or something, um, George Bernard Shaw went to the first performance and wrote, there was never a more exasperatingly brainless composition ever set on paper. It's, he clearly didn't have any respect for the music. I wanted to, through this model, convey something that uh, indicates why I find it a very enriching, grossing experience. And I think it's something to do with this appreciation beyond the mere sound of the notes, this appreciation of what it means in these abstract musical harmonic terms. So that's what I feel, that's the respect in which I think the model seems to be quite successful. I can only judge it by how other people respond to it. But it seems to have conveyed to people the sense that whilst they're listening to the music, they could be appreciating something else that you might, might need some sophisticated understanding of music to appreciate, but can in some sense be represented, if you like, by some different experience, a visual experience. Dr. Bynan and his colleagues now hope to interest businesses and other organisations in empirical modelling. They believe it could make a significant contribution in a whole range of areas, including computer graphics, educational technology and artificial intelligence. Our plans immediately are to, I think, to pr improve the tools, make them more accessible and um, easier to, to use, um, to write a book about empirical modelling, because we've been teaching it for several years now and it's time it went out in, in published form. Um, and to make links with conventional software development because we can extract programs, we believe, from our models but uh, we need much more experience and understanding of doing that uh, in the current climate.